All right, all right. Hey, everybody. This is uh, Founder Leroon, and I am going to stream some helpful tips, some getting started. If you want to interact with me and learn how to use Fantasy Grounds, or perhaps you want to um, set up your game, whatever it might be, um, I would you know, enjoy, invite you and enjoy having you with me. Um, this is not a you know, a scripted thing. Um, I'm willing to go into things if you need to. I'm going to be using the fifth edition rule set, and this is Fantasy Grounds Classic version 3.3.9. We are on the cusp of having Fantasy Grounds Unity come out within the next month or so. So a lot of the information I'm going to show you will apply still to the Unity edition. So no need to worry about, you know, having bad or old information. Most of this will still carry over. So I'm not too concerned about giving you the wrong impression or the wrong idea. And um, yeah, so we're going to get going. So first of all, I have the Fantasy Grounds interface. And I am going to show you how to load in things, where things are at, those sort of things. If you have any preliminary questions, just to see if you guys have any questions. That way I can help you guys. And also I will upload this video. So if there's any problems or issues, um, you know, in the future, this would be a good time to bring those up. So basically I'm starting off with the interface. I have all the rule sets here and Fantasy Grounds actually supports quite a few. Um, you have Savage Worlds and, of course, D&D 5e. Call of Cthulhu. You have the core rule system that everything's built on. Numenera, Pathfinder 1 and 2, Rollmaster Classic. There's Starfinder, Suede Edition of Savage Worlds. You have The Strange. There are older editions of D&D, like second edition, which is really cool. Those classics are being brought back. Uh, today, I'm going to use the fifth edition rule set. So I've already updated my client, but if you want to update, you check for updates here. And generally, Fantasy Grounds will release official updates on Tuesdays. So if you can remember that, um, don't do it right before your game. Um, just do it after or a week before, so in case anything goes wrong, you don't have to panic at the last minute. Um, also, up on the top right up here, this shows you what version you have. So if it says demo, obviously you have the demo client. If it just gives you the version, more than likely you have the standard edition. And then if you have ultimate, it'll tell you ultimate. Up in this top right corner, there's a little folder. If you open that, that goes into the guts or the directories within Fantasy Grounds. It's 5th edition. I'm going to give the campaign a name, which don't really have a good one, so I'll just call it Tutorial or Help, help or something like that. Okay, so Fantasy Grounds help tutorial. Um, over on this right-hand side are my choices for extensions. Now, if you get extensions, you do not want to do the whole bunch of those in the beginning. You want to learn what they do, how they affect Fantasy Grounds. And they also need to be tested and checked. So before you run a campaign, I would make a different campaign um, session and try them out before you load them. That way, in case it breaks your game or gives you trouble, you'll have that. The only thing I'm going to really load today is this font, Montserrat. It makes the font a little bit clearer and bigger so that you can see it more. Uh, this GM icon just changes a little logo in the chat window. Um, I am going to use a theme, which is actually just a photo in the background that has our community logo for Fantasy Grounds College. Um, 
there's a theme that changes the overall look of the background. I could load that, but um, I don't want it to confuse new users, so I'll just leave that as it is. Um, there's also a bunch of other things. I want to show portals later. This will allow you to move between maps, which is something you weren't able to do before. I'm going to look, this is a, a purchase product too, by the way. Uh, it was made by Diablo Bob and published by Rob Tui. Uh, the enhanced spell window is kind of handy. I'm going to show that later if I got time. And then the critically essentials, uh, critically awesome essentials, which deals with druids and such. And those are what I'm going to load. And as I said, this is version 3.3.9 and all of these different uh, extensions have been updated as well. So when you subscribe or download extensions, it's not a one and done. Every now and then you have to go and update them. So you just re-download them and replace. Uh, make sure you know what they do and also make sure that you, know, that you understand how it affects the game. And try to make sure you don't have extensions that interfere with one another. It's gonna take you a little while to understand what I'm talking about, but you don't want them to interfere with one another like if it's something that affects tokens you definitely don't want to load two things that do the essentially a similar function like right now i have this death indicators one which is a really cool um thing that actually changes your token to a tombstone when you die well i also have this critically essential essential critically awesome essentials extension which changes your token when you transform into a druid so you really don't want to mix and match those unless you've tested them and the authors have worked together to avoid issues. So be very careful when you load these extensions and make sure you know what they do. Most of them are just artwork, like for the background, but some of them change the way Fantasy Grounds works. You don't want to use those unless you know what you're doing. Uh, I'm going to load up this Rob Tui module loader. This just makes it more convenient for me. And there is a mood lighting extension which i really don't need but i'm going to show you something cool to do with mood lighting so i'm going to hit run test if you're able to get success that means you're able to host if you don't plan on being the dungeon master or the main host or the game master you don't have to worry about that you can just connect to your dm if you are going to host you have to figure out how to configure your computer to allow incoming connections So basically, um, when you uh, have people connect to your table, you have to get past your firewall, your antivirus, and you have to configure your router if you have one to allow incoming connections. I'm not going to go too deep into that. That's a networking thing. But before you go out and buy a bunch of materials, make sure that you can host somebody if you plan on running games. I can't see a thing you're clicking on. Yeah, it could just be the resolution. Um, sometimes people have uh, bad internet or sometimes the bandwidth is too much. So I appreciate that. Uh, that let me know. Um, this is something that can't be helped. A lot of people may be on an item or a, excuse me, not an item, but a uh, device that doesn't allow you to see the screen very well. And it is rather small, I do admit. Uh, not much I can do about that. Sorry about that. But oh, you can't see a thing. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm not really clicking on too much important right now. I'm kind of going into the settings and talking about what to do, what not to do. Um, so basically, I clicked on the 5e rule set. I named the campaign tutorial. I load up some extensions. And then I did the run test and it gives you an indicator as to whether it's successful or not. So once I've got all that done, I'm going to go ahead and hit start. Now I have a horrendous load time and that's because I have like 50,000 modules in there. So if you want to keep your load time down, try not to have too many tokens, third-party modules, and images, because every time you load Fantasy Grounds, 
it has to course through all that content. So try to make sure that you are not uh, loading too many things or have too many things, you know, stored in your um, folders for your library. Um, there are ways to get around that uh, simply by managing them on a monthly basis, put away ones that you're not using right away, you know, things like that. So Cantos, are you on a mobile device or a tablet? Or are you actually on a computer? Because I'm broadcasting at 1080, and if it's if it's not coming in clear, um, sorry about that. I don't know what to tell you. Um, it could just be a limitation. You're on a laptop. Uh, yeah. So if you have a small screen, it is going to be very difficult. Most laptops are 17 inch and below, unless you're of course you're plugged into a larger monitor. Yep. Okay, so there is a way to scale the resolution, actually, in Fantasy Grounds. So let's do that, since you're having vision problems uh, with seeing the interface. I'm going to close this campaign setup for right now. Um, this chat window, it can be altered and moved around a little bit. So right now, I'm going to clear all these licensing numbers on the left here. So I'm going to hit clear. And then I'm going to right click on here and I'm going to click the unlock position. And this will allow me to manipulate the size of the window by dragging the bottom right corner. So I'm just going to make it a little bit smaller. And I am going to sort of kind of make it so that I can resize it later. I'm not going to lock it yet because I'm going to change the resolution a little bit. So there's a command. Um, you do a right slash or forward slash. You type the phrase scale UI. Right now I have it set to about 80 or 85. I'm going to set it back to about 90. And that will give me less room to work with, but it will also give you a little bit more visibility. So I'm going to hit 90 or type in 90. So it's forward slash scale UI with a space after that, and then 90, and I'm gonna hit enter. So it makes it a little bit bigger. And now I'm gonna right click and restore the window. And then I'm going to re-maximize it. And that should make it a little bit bigger. And if you're on a small laptop, I wouldn't consider going any lower than 90. And what that does is it shrinks some of this interface and gives you a little bit more room, but it's harder to see. So that's the difference. So this is what it looks like at 90% of the scale. 100% looks great. I mean, it's, you could see everything really clearly, but you don't have a lot of room. So being that this is a tutorial, I don't need a lot of room. So I'll go ahead and put it back to 95%. So since I'm not actually playing, I can do that. So now it's even a little bit bigger, but I have less real estate. So let me know if that's a little bit helpful for you. I don't know if it's going to help much, but this is scaled at 95%. And if you're on a laptop, this is a pro if you have a small screen, this is probably about where you want to be anyways. So hopefully that helps you guys a little bit more. Also, I'm going to be uploading this on YouTube, so if you guys want to check it out later, you can. So the next step is to arrange the windows. So I'm going to arrange the chat window where I want it. I'm going to bring up the combat tracker, which is this nice handy dandy uh, combat tracker that you can use for putting your NPCs and your players on here. So I'm going to put that over here. And then I'm going to turn on the dice tower, which I use quite effectively as a game master. As a player, or if you're just messing around, you don't really have to activate it. But I'm going to go into the settings, which is gear cog to the top right. I'm going to scroll down, and you see this dice tower. So it's in the options under game, GM. You're going to click on table, dice tower, click that on. 
You'll notice it doesn't show up because that's what's being displayed to your players. So if you want to see it as well, you have to click on chat, show GM roles. So they're kind of related and independent of each other. So now here's the dice tower. I'm going to right click on it, drag it over and drop it right next to the dice and then lock it. So now I can lock the chat window in place as well. So I'm going to lock it. And there are another set of options I want to show you. So this uh, decal, you can change this, you can turn it off. Or in this case, I put the FGC banner. Or like I said, you could turn it off too. So if it's too distracting, or if it gives away your plot, that would be a good way to, to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and change it to this banner. So those are generally the things people want to mess with in, in the beginning. Uh, I'm going to close this now. And what I'm going to go over is how to activate your books that you've purchased in your library. So if you wanted to activate your books and you want to know how to share them, those sort of things, I'm going to cover that now. So right now I kind of have a clean slate. So I'm going to click to library. I do have the portals module loaded. It's a supplement that goes with this Fantasy Grounds. It's third party, so it does not come with the D&D uh, &D 5e rule set or Fantasy Grounds. This was uh, purchased on the DMs Guild, but I wouldn't worry too much about that right now. So you have different views. So right now, the default view is GM, which gives you all these banners on the right. As a player view, you click play and it just gives you the banners that you want for playing. You click create PC and that gives you just the banners you need to create characters. And if you click on all, that gives you access to everything. So that's what I'm going to leave it at. The next step is to actually go ahead and, um, you know, open up the books, activate the library books, those sort of things. So. I'm going to go to the library, which I'm in already, and I'm going to click on Modules. Now, when you first purchase Fantasy Grounds, the only thing you have is the SRD. So the SRD are just a bunch of system reference documents. And those are the very basis of the rule set itself. So you can load all those if you own just the standard license or even the ultimate license, you don't have any content. Also the basic rules. These two modules give you the ability to create a Dwarven Cleric. So if you've never built a character before, you can load those two up and only build a Dwarven Cleric. That's all the rules they have embedded. It's just one straightforward character. I think it's a Dwarven Cleric Acolyte and that's pretty much all you can build. So until you buy the actual player's handbook and some of the other content, you're very limited as to what you can build. Now with the SRD, you can build your own modules on top of that, but you're not gonna have a lot of content. You have to build it all from scratch. The basic rules just kind of give you a taste of the player's handbook. So that's what those are for. Um, also, there are token modules that come. So you go to tokens, and you go to module. So here you can load the base tokens. They give you animal tokens. They give you um, character tokens and they give you monster tokens. So those come free with the uh, Fantasy Grounds as it stands. And then you also, you can buy, or you can buy other ones, that, you know, down the road. Some of the modules give you some tokens. And then you can also buy third party stuff. Um, I recommend keeping your token tokens to a minimum if you can, and try to keep them organized. Don't get too many like I have. I have like 50,000 token modules and I have no idea what I even have. So to keep that mitigated and keep it organized, you want to try to, you know, be, be organized about when you purchase them. Make sure you're going to use them, that sort of thing. 
or you can also make your own. There's resources out there to help you with that. So for instance, here's this Druid S in distress. This is a, a module that I cobbled together. And this is something I was going to use for uh, an adventure that I was going to run a one shot. So I'm going to expand these out a little bit so you can see them. So I have a couple banners here and then I have some NPCs that have to do with the adventure. Most of the time though, you're going to get pogs. So fantasy grounds, you know, you don't normally get these fancy, you know, three dimensional top down. Uh, rule set, there's not any in there. And then there's like the, uh, let's see, monster manual pog. So here's like an NPC pog. So this is generally what you get is something like this. So this is actually a Sturge that I, I put together. Um, but you can really get some really fancy ones. So here's some hellish tokens that I used for a Avernus campaign. I kind of just threw a collection together so I'd have stuff to draw upon. But generally you get the round circular pogs. That's normally what you get. And then you also get free letter tokens that comes with Fantasy Grounds. So that's, that's what that is. So now the next step is to actually activate some of your modules. So the long way to do it, or the roundabout way, is to go to modules and then search for whatever modules that you want. So I'm going to load the Druid Essentials one because that's not a, a official module. So this is made by Diablo Bob and published by Rob. And I'm going to click load on both of these. These give you the uh, capability of transforming a specific, um, like a druid, into a wild shape. And then the portals one allows you to create portals between different maps. So I will show that a little bit later. Um, to make things easier though, for loading, what Fantasy Grounds and Smiteworks have done is they've created a setup, which pops up when you very, when the very first time you set up the screen. I kind of skipped it because I wanted to show you the layout that I use, which is kind of a tried and true method. I'm also going to, let's see, um, going to have a way to show you how to use the setup. So here. If you've accidentally closed it and you want to go back to it, you go to the option and you click setup. It brings this back up in case you've missed it or you want it to come back. I'm going to click show on load because I don't want it to come back next time I log into the table. And if I ever need it again, I can go back to options and bring it up. So this takes you to the website and to the discord. I'm going to hit next. This takes you. Well, this one's actually custom, so this takes you to the FGC Discord and the uh, Fantasy Grounds College website. But this is where it actually starts. The user manual, wiki guides, and forums. Hit next. Here are the data modules. You can load those here. So I'm going to load just the core rules, which is the player's handbook, the monster manual, and the dungeon master's guide. So now here it's confirmed. So even if you don't own all these, you can still um, push that and it'll load what you do have. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit close. And if you go to the library, you will see that the, the main books are loaded. So they're right here. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load some coding effects modules. Now these do not come with Fantasy Grounds, but I'm gonna go ahead and load uh, the coding effects. Here's Rob 2E effects coding module. And I have most of those. What's that? And what else do I need to do? Oh, so I'm going to go to the next section. And these are tokens. 
So like I was saying earlier, you got free tokens. You have tokens with a base, which are look more like pogs. And they make them a little bit easier to see on a battle map. You have the free tokens, the Devon Knight token bundles, which I recommend you be careful when you have those. If you have more than 10 sets, don't click these. I to actually go to the, the uh, tokens area and load them manually. Because you could crash Fantasy Grounds if you load too many at once. So if you have any of those, you can go ahead and load those in here. So here's the next. This is, takes you to the options, which takes you back to here. And then I want to hit finish, and that's done. That's the way to quickly activate your library. And it takes you through some setup. It doesn't show you how to lay the screen out. This is more or less preference. But this is a really good way to, to lay it out, at least until you get used to it. So the other things that you can do in Fantasy Ground are pretty interesting. You can change settings based on your preferences, and I will go through some of those later. But basically those allow you to um, change the way the combat tracker behaves, change the way things are displayed in the game, so on and so forth. So I'm going to go ahead and... Um, let's see, on teleport, share map with all players. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close this out. And I'm going to take a look at a map pack, which I've purchased. Now, map packs can be made or created individually. You can make your own, or you can download them from the store. And then they also come with the modules sometimes. So it depends on what product you have. So I'm going to go ahead and click on library. And then I'm going to go ahead to module. I'm going to click on the search by name. And I'm going to type meanders. So meanders are maps that are meant to work together. They kind of have a way that they can connect. You can't really connect them in Fantasy Grounds, but you can see where they're where they're supposed to be connected. So I'll give you an example. So I want to load this uh, this jungle uh, setup, or maybe the ice world, or maybe even the ship. I'll do the ship starter one. So I'll click load. And what that does is it loads the map as a library item in the map pack. And it also loads it in the maps and images. So now from here, I can select the ship starter meanders. And then up here, uh, Chris, the author of these, actually made a, a selector. So what's cool about this you have a docked version, you have a low resolution and a mid resolution uh, and variation decks. You have docked, you have a low, galleon low, top, middle. So you have these galleons that are, you know, they're mid quality and these are lower quality. So it depends on the resolution of your computer, how large your screen is. They have one that features sharks. They have the top galley. They have uh, some steamships. Here's some versions of it underwater. There's a Kraken. There's a Viking ship, a freighter. There's a couple small islands. I mean, it's a really cool pack. So if you're into pirates and airships and ocean adventures, this is the pack to get. They have a burning version. They have a ghost ship. They have one sinking. That was a nice skeletal ship. So these are pretty cool. So what I'm gonna do is open up the lower quality ones. So the top, middle, low for the galleon. So let's see, here is the lowest part. So I'll get that map. There's the middle part. There's one with no munitions, meaning there's no cannons. I'm going to go with the medium one. So there's the mid deck. And then I need the top.
Here's the top deck. And let's see. And here's the upper deck. So this one has munitions on it. This has the cannons and such. This one does not. So it depends on how you want to, what you want to, you know, display. So what I'm going to do is take a look at these uh, pirate ships here, the ghost version. Those look pretty cool. So here's the top variety. You have the, the mid. It's pretty cool. So you can put ghosts and zombies and stuff. Skeleton. You have the skeletal ship, which is like a really cool evil looking bone ship, which I think is cool. So let me do, let's see, there's a shark one. There's a galley top. Yeah, so here's the galley top. Then they have a docked version. So you have this docked version where it's unloading and offloading content. Let's see. Top, 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 mid, low. So let's go with, let's see, low, mid, top. Okay, so there's two different ones here. So here's the sharks. Let's go with this low, medium, top. So low, mid, and top. So here's the one the top that doesn't have any cannons. Here's the mid deck with no ammunition. And then here's the lower deck storage. So these are the three levels of the ship. There's a staircase right here in the center. And then this one has an extra staircase over here so that you can go up and right into the, the uh, different sections of the boat. And then there's a the captain's quarters, of course, and some of the crew area. So, the first thing I'm going to do with a map like this is usually when you buy maps, they'll already have the, the you know, all the different lines on here for the grid. In this case, these do not. These come without the grid, and there's a reason for that. Um, it can be difficult to line the grid up, especially when you're new to Fantasy Grounds. So if you want an easier time, when you find a map, try to find one without the grid. And then you can kind of use the surrounding information to give you an idea of what you want to use for the grid. So in other words, you can choose your own grid. So in order to make this stuff work properly, you need to put a grid on it. So that is achieved by unlocking the map. And then what you're gonna do is left click and drag. So I don't really care exactly, you know, what exactly it's, how big it is, as long as it makes shit, you know, a lot of sense. So here's a barrel. So you probably wanna use that as a guide. So I'm going to go ahead and drag this over and then I'm going to right click on the map, click layers and set grid. So now I have this little cursor and I can left click and draw what I need to for a grid. So that's pretty close. That's 50 pixels. So that's pretty close. I think 48 would have been better. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and redo that. So if you don't like how it turned out, you can right click on the map, go to layers, and you can delete. You can just say grid off. 
I'm going to draw that a little bit nicer. So I'm going to go ahead and click layers, set grid. And this time I'm going to make it at 48. I think that's a better number. Actually, yeah, I think that's about right. 40 looks pretty good, actually. Yeah, so that's about a five foot square. So the barrel's not five feet across, but you know that it's at least, you know, a couple feet across. So you have to kind of scale these the way you would can imagine real life objects. So again, I'm gonna erase it. Now a barrel's probably no more than a foot and a half. So let's take a look at that. So right click on here, go to layers, set grid, and I'm gonna use the barrel as a point of reference. So yeah, I think 48 is a better number. So 48 is about the right scale for these maps. So there we go, there's that. And I'm gonna systematically do the same thing. I'll lock this one for right now. I'm gonna bookmark it. So there's the top part. Now I'm gonna take the mid deck and do the same thing. So I'm gonna use a 48 by 48 uh, grid. So I'm gonna right click on it, click layers, set grid, and I'm gonna go with a 48. Yeah, it's pretty good. So you can roughly get about two people up and down the stairs, which is about right. Um, let's see. So I'm gonna go ahead and bookmark this one by dragging the link down to this hotkey. And now I'm going to bookmark these. Let's see. Um, right click on here, click layers, click set grid, and I'm gonna set the grid again to 48. So roughly size of two men or two people. Yeah, that's close enough. So there's the grid for all three maps. So that's how you grid a map. And once you do that, when you add characters to this map, it helps with scaling. So I'll show you the difference on that. So now I'm gonna add some characters. I'm gonna click PC. And if I click this green plus button, it'll bring up a new character sheet. And then I can build one. I'm not gonna build one right now. I've done plenty of those. I'm gonna actually import one. So I'm gonna bring in a couple that are already made. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this edit button on the far right. And then I'm gonna click this import character button, the blue arrow, and click the blue arrow again. And it takes me to my hard drive in which I will be able to import. So I'm gonna import a level four war wizard. He's a minotaur. So now when I hit back, his name is Moo Shakalaka. I actually built him on another stream. One of the one of the uh, one of the viewers called named him for me. So here's Moo Shakalaka. This is his character sheet, and I'm going to put him over here on the right hand side. Uh, he was going through some trials here, so I have to delete his death saves. I have to take away his wounds. And I'm going to replace his portrait back to what I have. So I had this portrait of this uh, war wizard minotaur. So now when I add him to the combat tracker, he's here. So the first thing you do, build your characters. You always add them to the combat tracker first before you add them to a map. So Mushakalaka needs to be rested because I had him fighting before this. So I'm gonna hit menu. I'm gonna click this eyeball, which is the rest symbol. And then I'm gonna click long rest and that will rest him now. So any of his abilities or anything he's expended 
they'll be reset. So he's got everything now that he needs. So Moo Shakalaka just bought himself passage on the ship. So he is going to be aboard. He has some a dagger. He has a quarterstaff, a sling. He can cast spells. He has a feat called uh, Tactical Wit. So that gives him extra initiative based on his intelligence modifier. So I'll go ahead and put that on him because that's an ongoing effect. He has the feat Warcaster, which gives him advantage on constitution saving throws, especially when it comes to um, casting spells and keeping concentration. So I'll go ahead and put that on him. And then he has arcane recovery if he wants to quickly recover some of his lower spells and then he has this um, arcane deflection in which he's learned to weave magic to fortify himself so if he's hit by an attack or if he fails a saving throw he can use the reaction to gain a plus two to your ac against that attack or a plus four bonus to the saving throw but he can only use this uh, feature until the end of the next turn so other than cantrip you can't use spells or anything this would be a counted as using a spell he has a charge feature and he can ram people he has two different damage types one for if, if he charges with his horns and this damage is for if he charges with his uh with a melee weapon he gets extra damage he has his cantrip all his spells are here and then his standard actions are down below so this character is pretty much ready to go so he's all set so to make this a little easier and quicker there's a couple things i can do as a player so i can drag this this arrow thing here which allows you to pass your turn it says next actor so i'm going to drag that over here so i have this handy uh the initiative roll if I double click here, it'll roll initiative. So it adds the, your dex bonus. So in this case, he got a total of 19. So that's where his initiative is. To make it easier next time, I'm gonna drag it and drop it in hotkeys. So I don't have to come back here. Next step is he has Arcana, Athletics, History, and Persuasion. So I'm gonna take his Perception roll shortcut that and I'm gonna take his athletics roll those are the most common ones used it makes it much easier for you and your players if you learn how to use these shortcuts the next thing is all this stuff I don't have to worry about these are all notes about my features I've already got those dealt with all his inventory is organized ready to go including his coins all his role-playing notes are here. And this is Adventures Lead Log. I'm not gonna go into that. Most of the time, I'm gonna be on this combat uh, sheet here. This is the actions tab. So when you're playing, you got everything set up. This is where you're gonna spend most of your time. And I'm in combat and actions mode. If I wanna prepare new spells or change them out, I can go to preparation mode and switch the spells out. If I wanted to build or add on, I'd go to standard mode. But in this case, combat mode is where I'm at. This is where you're ready to play. So if you guys have any questions, uh, let me know in the chat. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up one of the maps, or actually several of them. So first of all, I'm going to bring up the top deck. Okay, here's the very top deck. This is where the captain of the boat is. So he is in with the captain. This is where the, the main front of the ship is. Looks like they had a poker party and some pizza or something. So I'm going to go ahead and drag Mushakalaka onto the map. So. I do that by dragging this token. So as you can see, his token will automatically scale to the size of the square. 
So that's his token. Now when you're using Fantasy Ground, you want to make sure you, you end up in a square, not in the middle of four squares. The other thing you can do as a Game Master is right click on a token and lock the token. So if I hold down the right control key and I drag this this guy, I can tell how far he's moving. So there's 10 feet. He's going to move here and then he's going to move here. So that's 30 feet. And I click the middle mouse button to approve it and he moves to where I want him to go. So this is a doorway that leads into underneath here, I believe. Or actually, it goes into this room. So this could be, you know, you just move through, no big deal. But there's a problem that you can run into when you have something like this that has multiple decks. So the portal plugin or extension allows the DM to set up portals. So this is how we're going to illustrate it. So right now, I have a staircase. Now it looks like it's a little bit off, but I'm going to go ahead and use it. But it's for this staircase here. So this open doors here is for this staircase over here. So this takes you down to the mid deck. So the mid deck is a way to get through all of these different levels. And then this one in the center here goes down to the bilge. So I'm going to set up the portal first for this. So I have the portals extension loaded in the extension link. And it shows up here as a module. And if you need to learn how it works, you open a story temple template, excuse me, and it tells you how to do it. Or you can also click the portals button. And this is where you can make new portals. But this is where they'll appear when you create them. So the first portal that I'm going to make is the one here that goes from this deck down to here. So before, the DM would have to manually drag the tokens from one map to another or from the combat track to here. This makes it much more easy. So what I'm going to do is create a portal in this area. So I unlock the map and I have the extension already made. So I click on this square, which you can put a token there if you want. But I'm going to click on this edit mode. It turns on the edit mode. I'm going to zoom into the map a little bit and I'm going to draw the portal. So I want it to start in this doorway area. So I'm going to go ahead and drag this. Immediately, it pops up. It wants me to name this portal. So I'm going to call it Upper Deck. Now you can set it to exit only, or you can set it to prompt. I'm going to have it go to prompt. I want this to say, do you wish to go to mid deck? So it's a prompt. So if a player clicks on this area or they move their token in here, that prompt will come up and it will give them a chance to say yes or no before they get pushed over to the next map. So that's what that's for. So I'm going to go ahead and lock it. And it automatically closes the edit mode. So that's good. And now that portal is set up. So this is the area where the actual portal is. So if I lock the map, I'm going to go to the next map and I'm going to set up the mid deck. So the mid deck is going to have a couple portals. And technically, you can set up another portal here that would take you down to the decks through the, uh, the freight area. But I'm not going to do that. So this next portal 
is going to be set up around this area. So what I'm going to do is unlock the map and I'm going to click on this toggle portal edit mode and I'm going to trace or draw right about where I want the portal. So in this case, There we go. I'm going to call it mid deck. And I am going to click here for the prompt. This is going to be mid deck one or A. So mid deck A is going to be connected to the top deck. The reason I call it A because the other one is going to take you down below. So this is going to say, do you want to go to the top? So I'm just going to word it. Do you wish to go above deck? So that's a prompt. I'm going to go ahead and lock it. And... Now what I need to do is link these together. So the upper deck needs to link to this mid deck. So I'm going to drag the icon or the token over to link these two together. So the upper deck is going to be linked to the mid deck. The mid deck is going to be linked to the upper deck from these two portals. So what I'm going to do is drag the upper deck this token here to here. And what you'll notice is this turns green, which means that it is linked to another portal, which means you're going, you're doing good. Lock this and I lock this. So now those two portals are set. So they're both green now. So what happens is this. So if I move Mushakalaka to the upper deck doorway, that should say lower deck, but I label it as upper deck. So I'm gonna go through here and move him here. And then I wanna move him in. I have to manually move him forward. Do you wish to go down to mid deck? I'm going to say yes. So now he appears down here. So now he's basically he's good to go. He's now on the mid deck. So now I'm going to have him go through the boat. So he has to go around here. So I'm going to right click on him. Make sure he's locked on this map too here drag him there and he can cut through here takes him one round to get there and then he has to cut by this this thing here he could have went through this way it'd been a lot easier but i'm showing you the roundabout way so he's going to go here he's going to go here So that's roughly two turns. He moves here and here. So this one will take him to the lower deck. So I need to make another portal. So I'm going to call this mid deck portal B, where this is going to go to the basement or the build, whatever you want to call it. So mid deck A is above deck, mid deck B is below deck, which is going to also be the bilge. Or the bottom so i'm going to already unlock the map it's already unlocked i'm going to draw the portal by turning on the portal option and i'm going to click in this area to set up the zone for the portal so mid deck b
This was going to say, do you want to go to the bilge or something like that? Yeah, it says, do you want to go below into the bilge? So that is a prompt so that if someone moves there, they will actually get this message. So I'm going to move that aside. And now I'm going to bring up the lower deck or the bilge. So here's the lower deck. Here's where they're going to end up. So I'm going to unlock that. And I am going to place the portal. So I'm going to draw it right about here at the bottom of the stairs. And put it up to about there. Now it's going to say mid deck, or actually this is going to be the bilge. And then the prompt is going to say, do you want to go up to the mid deck? So that's how that goes. So then I'm going to um, link these together. So the mid deck is going to be linked to the bilge. So I'm going to link the bilge to the mid deck. Mid deck B. And I'm going to lock both of them. And now those are set up. So the lower mid deck or the mid deck has two portals. One to go down, one to go up. So now I'm going to move this character into this area. So technically, he has to go from here. I'm going to lock the map too. And he's going to go here. And he's going to go here. And then when he moves in here, Do you want to go below into the bilge? So if I say yes, it automatically shares the map with the player. And now he's on the bottom layer. So that is how the portals works. Very handy tool. And it's a way that you can do multi-level dungeons, multi-deck ships, or even magic portals that take you from one region to another. So that is the usage of the new portals, which I really think is really cool. Before, you'd have to take this token and drag it individually or as a group to each new map. And they don't necessarily start off right away where you want them to come out. So this kind of helps with that. Another thing you can do to help organize this is to link the ship together with pins. So in other words, this deck is the, basically the top deck. So I can, basically what I can do is if you don't have the portals extension, you can use the pins to sort of help you with this. So I'm going to drag this pin onto this map. So this map is going to be linked here. So when you click on that, brings up this map and vice versa on this map I'm gonna link this map to here now conversely the lower deck I am going to link the mid deck To here and then this map I will link it to here so this map is going to be have two links next to it the ones for the lower ones for the upper so what that does it gives you the visibility right away so if you want to go below deck you pop that up it takes you there and then this one takes you to the lower deck.
This is kind of how you used to have to do it back in the day. So that's what that is. So hopefully that gives you some ideas of how to link maps together. But I really like the portals extension. It's really cool. It's really new too. So if you ever use portals in your games, that's how you can use it. Um, if you want to find portals online, just look for portals extension on the Dungeon Masters Guild. So I can do that. So I'm going on the Dungeon Masters Guild, which is a third party um, product site. Get Fantasy Grounds modules there. So Portal is basically an extension. So fairly new product. It's like 10 bucks. I think in the long run, it's worth it. Um, some people might get a little, you know, hey, that's too much money, but it does what it does. I mean, it's really cool. Okay. So here's the link in case you want to look at it. Put that in the chat just for you. So if you want to check that out, there's the link for it. Okay, so I showed you how to set up the, the, the screen. I showed you how to grid the map. I showed you a little bit of that and how to import a character. So once you have everything set up correctly, um, you can double click on this token. And if you lose the map accidentally, you can double click on your portrait photo up here. And, or excuse me, your token. And what it'll do is bring up the last map you were on. So that's a quick tip here. So Moose Shakalaka is down in the build. He heard some noise. So he's kind of concerned. So he's down here scouting around, seeing what's going on. So we'll see what happens. So I'm going to close this temporarily. Or actually, I want to shrink it. I'm going to shrink this so it's not so big. I have a little bit more room. And I'm going to right click, click layers, and oops, right click, click on resize, and do the vertical. So now I can see the full ship. Alright, so I'm going to make an encounter. So. I'm going to say that there might be a little stowaway in here. Or maybe something in more dangerous. Maybe there's a squid or an octopus or something. I don't know. Something down here that's not good. I will say maybe a Sahuigan. Let's see how he does against a Sahuigan. So I'm going to go to the NPCs and look for Sahuigan. So these are coming out of the player's hand. All right, so here's a Sahuig. This is a standard. Well, I don't just want one Sahuigan. I want at least two. So I'm going to open up Encounters. And I'm going to make my own. So I'm going to click on the Edit button. Click on the green plus button. And that's a blank encounter. So what I'm going to do is drag this over and drop it in there. But I really don't like these tokens, so I might replace that token with a unique one. 
But until then, I'm going to drag this over. There's your Sahu again. If you hit this refresh button, it gives you it's a CR half. It's worth 100 XP. But I'm going to change it to 2. And now when I hit refresh, it becomes a CR 1. And it's worth 200. I'm going to call the encounter Sahuigan Stowaway. So I'm going to encounter. So, so who again stow away? So this, I'm going to link this onto this map. So I'm going to say they're back here, hiding amongst this, uh, this uh, material back here. So there's some barrels and such. So I went ahead and linked that, but I know where it's at. I don't have to keep messing around with it. Now I'm going to also add a new token. So I don't have to necessarily add the token at this level where the original token is. I can add it at this level at the counter level. So I'm going to go to token and search for a Sahu again. So I have this one that I made with a base, so it's a little bit easier to see. And then I have these regular ones. So this is a priestess, so I'm not going to use that. And then there's some other ones that are on as well. So I'm going to go ahead and use the warrior. I have to unlock it first. I hit that. And now everything is set. I have new token. Ready to go. So now when I bring that up, there's a Sahu again. Now I'm going to put them on this map a little bit strategically. So they probably stow away in the middle of the night when the ship was loading and they've been hiding down here for a while. So there's probably a dead body or something down here. And it looks like there's some oil leaks and footprints down here. Looks like they've had some trouble. So I'm gonna go ahead and place these ahead of time. So I do that by dragging the Sahu again onto the battle map. And then I'm gonna drag the other one as well. There's one by the door, and then there's one in the back. So that's where they're at. Now, if I didn't want my players to see that, because right now they could. So what I'm going to do is mask this area back here. So that's something you can do to help. So I'm going to right click on the map, click layer, and click enable mask. So I would have done this ahead of time. But I'm going to go ahead and unmask this area first. Now I'm going to exit the mask mode. So now he has an idea of what's in here, but he doesn't see what's across the ship. So I would have had this done ahead of time before the encounter. Anyways, I want to move him closer. So his first turn, he moves here, and he moves out here. So I'm going to have him roll a perception check. So on his sheet, he has perception, but since I shortcutted it, all I need to do is click down here in the shortcut keys. So you rolled a 16. That's pretty good. So let me see if the creatures have a stealth or not. Pretty sure they do. So again, I'm going to right click, click layers. Actually resize the vertical. So I'm going to click here. Bring up their stat block. 
They have a high perception, but not a very good stealth. So he hears them. They're kind of just hanging out back here, out of sight. So he, on his turn, he moves closer to the doorway. So I'm going to right click, block his token, move this down here. And now he's on his way to the door. So use the middle mouse button to approve the action. So he doesn't know it's on the other side of the door, but he hears something. So he knocks on the door and he says, who's in there? And he went ahead. He already has his um, actions activated, the ones that he can use. Um, his first action, though, is going to be to cast Mage Armor. So when he casts this, he's going to drag it to himself. And that applies Mage Armor. So that's his first turn. He moved. He said who's go who goes there. And he cast the spell to protect himself. So that's his turn. So next turn, nothing happens. They actually get quiet. So it's back to his turn again. So he is going to open the door. And I'm going to unmask the doorway in that area. So I'm going to hit resize first and do the vertical so I can see the whole ship. I'm going to right click on the map, click layers, I'm going to go back into mask mode and unmask this area. So he can see this area now. If he opens the door, hit this down arrow he'll find these guys in so when he opens the door I'm going to show all NPC as he can see them both now so at the doorway or the door frame he opens the door as one of his actions the Sahuigan is on the other side of the door waiting for him so the Sahuigan is actually going to get it's sort of like an attack of opportunity when it's his turn. But the mate is going to try to um, defensively hold up his staff. And he can't really move backwards too well because he's got debris in the way. So you might try to move aside. So he's going to move here, which doesn't move him out of the range, but it kind of gets him out of the doorway. And that's his turn. So the Sahu again, number one, he makes an attack, which he can from there. So he moves forward through the doorway, pushes his way through, and he has like a spear-like item. So I'm going to take this, expand it out, and then I have this here. Now he gets a multi-attack. So he gets two melee attacks, one with his bite and one with his claws or spear. So in this case, he's using a spear. So he jabs with his spear first. So that will be this attack. This is not throwing it. And it is a plus three to a hit. So I'm going to take this attack roll, drop it on Mooshakalaka, and he missed. And then he follows through with a vicious bite. Those jaws go snapping. And this time, he connects. So he takes a nice gash out of Mushakalaka's hide. So a nice little painful wound opens up on his shoulder. And a little bit of blood comes out. And the creature is getting crazy. They get this blood frenzy. So the who again has advantage on melee attack rolls against any creature that doesn't have all its hit points. So on his next turn, he is going to be able to get advantage because he's going crazy. He has a taste of blood. So that's they're kind of related to sharks, so that's why they act that way. So now I'm going to hit the down arrow. He hears the blood front, so he moves forward. And he tries to squeeze his way past his ally. So he can do so, but the cost of movement is high. 
So he loses 10 feet of move, but he still makes it through. And what he does is he waves his, his uh, spear and he ends up launching it forward before he attacks. So he moves out, pushes past his ally, and makes a throw with his spear. So instead of jabbing, he's going to throw it. So to target this individual, all I have to do is click on the target and hold down the right control key, and it now it says targets Moonshakalaka. And now I'm going to double click on the attack roll. One of this attack roll is for the um, jabbing, and then this attack roll is for throwing. So even with that, he missed. So he no longer can attack with the spear. But he can move closer on his next turn. So that's his turn. So Mooshakalaka is in a world of hurt. So he's not sure exactly what to do. But he knows he's got to survive. So in order to free up space, he's going to charge into Sahuga number two or whoever gets in his way. So he's going to use his melee charge. So that is a D6. So if he does damage, he'll get an extra D6. He's going to use his horn charge or whatever you want. This is his additional weapon. He's going to move forward. And he's going to attack this guy with a charge. He doesn't have the room for it, so he cannot charge in this situation. So I'm going to have to remove that extra D6. What he can do, though, is try to attack Sahuga number one or Sahuga number two. So what I think he's going to do is cast a spell that's going to give him some room. So rather than melee attack, he's going to do a spell. He has Thunder Wave. So he can do a 15-foot cube originating from me, and they have to make a saving throw. So rather than moving forward, he's going to take a Thunderous Force. Each creature in a 15-foot cube has to make a save. So I'm going to draw the cube first. But first I want to get out of the mask mode. So exit mask. Then I'm going to right click, go to pointers, and I'm going to draw a square. That's a 15 foot cube. That's going to also make a lot of noise and bring more people down to help. So he's going to blast these guys with this cube. So this is called Thunder Wave. So now I'm going to target both of these creatures. So I'm going to hold down the control key, click on Sahuagin 2 and Sahuagin 1. If you mouse over, it shows you the distance that they are from him. So they're within range. Now he's going to force the saving throw, which is this cast button. So one of them failed, one of them saved. So now I'm going to apply damage. So one of them only took half damage, the other took full. The one that takes full is going to be knocked back a certain amount of feet. So I need to see which one it is. So one of them's pushed 10 feet away. The other one is not. So, Sahuagin 2 succeeded. So this guy is not blown back. But this guy, Sahuagin 1, is. And it kind of makes sense because he's in a... Uh, basically a confined area. So he's moved back 10 feet. So he got blasted back. So that's his turn. <laughs> FTC in the house, spreading that knowledge. Love it. Yep, thanks, man. How do you make them move like that? Okay, so basically, um, 
as the DM, you have to hold the control key. And in order to get it to work, that's what you have to do as the host. When you're a player, you don't have to worry about that. But you also have to lock the tokens. So what I mean by that is you right click on any token, doesn't matter if it's an enemy or an ally, and you click on unlock or lock token. You can't choose, pick and choose which ones. It's either all of them are locked or none of them. So if you lock them first, then you can keep track of the movement. So in other words, as the DM, you have to hold the control key and move the token and then move it again and then you click the middle mouse button to approve it. And that allows it to move. Hopefully that hurt. But it helps a little. Yeah, so you can only you can only move uh you know, tokens that are are locked. If they're not locked, the characters can move them wherever they want. So during battle, you want to turn on locked tokens. And that'll help you with that. That way you're not, you know, allowing them to move just any old wear. Another thing is, you know, don't let them go through walls. It drives me nuts. So that movement that I did there was a little bit janky, but he does have somewhat of a pathway. But honestly, if I wanted him to move through this debris, unless he made like a acrobatics or athletics check, this would slow him down and be considered rough terrain. So one way you can help with your movement so that they don't move too far as far as squares go is you can go to the options, scroll all the way down to the bottom, and there is a map diagonal distance setting. Turn that to variant, and that counts the every other diagonal square as 10 feet. That way, they're not moving 45 feet. They're actually moving 30. So what I'm going to do is move this here and then move it here because he's moving around all these bags of debris and then move it up here. So that's 15 feet. So that's probably as far as he can move in one turn. So you would consider this rough terrain because he's moving around all these obstacles. He's going to lose 5 or 10 feet of movement regardless because of the obstacles. What you don't want is a player going like this and just cutting through everything. Because it also cuts down the amount of movement, but you would have to tax them a lot more. That was 20 feet. So if you did it the right way, you'd move here then move here, and then move here. So the player should carve a path through where they're going as best they can. I hate it when, okay, let's say you wanted to go back to the staircase, when they do this. That is complete BS. You can't go through walls. You, yeah, you just don't do that. So if they do that, pick the token up, drop it back down, that cancels the movement, tell them to trace their path. So in this case, he cannot move past this this guy. He has to knock him out of the way. But if he was able to get by, he would move here and here. And he'd move over here. It's basically as far as he could move in one turn. That's his movement rate. And then his next round, he'd move here and here. So when you're moving tokens around, make sure they follow a path. Otherwise, all these little obstacles and the walls and the difficulty of the terrain do not do anything. They don't matter. And it kind of ruins the, the immersion. So there's a lot of clutter here, so it's kind of hard to move around. Plus, it's confined area, so there's really not a room room for them to, to run. So that would be how you would do it correctly. Yeah, only the DM can do that. Yes, that's right. Thanks, dead hand. So, 
if you're a player, you have no control over that. That is just basically up to the DM. When we're doing role playing or just exploring, I don't mind allowing the players to move around a little on their own. But once we get to a combat situation or something where we have to take turns, then I will lock the token. And that'll keep them from moving all over the place. And if they do move, you get to approve it. And the way to disapprove it would be just to pick the token up, drop it back down, and tell them to redo their path. So now back to the story. I'm moving him back where he belongs. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to cut through the walls, go through all the debris, go back to where he was. So Moon Shakalaka just took his turn. He blasted these creatures out of his way. All he bought himself a little movement, and that was about it. So technically, he could move here. That's about as far as he can move without getting attack of opportunity. So that's where he moves to. So that's his turn. This guy moves out. And he attacks Moonshakalaka with his claws. I believe... No, this is the guy that has a spear. So he's going to take his spear and just jab at him with it from this angle. So he's going to take his spear. And he rolls a one. So I'm going to say he drops his spear. He has no more movement. He loses his attack. So that's his turn. So Hooligan number two is the one that threw his spear. And it's sitting on the floor against the wall over here. Or maybe it's still sticking in the moon shakalaka. But he has the blood frenzy because he bit him. So he gets advantage on his attack rolls. So I have to click ADV. And then he's going to use his claws instead of his spear. So he still missed, even with advantage. So that's good. And now he tries to follow through with another bite. He's got to taste the blood. So again, ADV for the bite. And this time he hits. So he gets another vicious bite. So Moon Shakalaka took some more damage. So that's his turn. For Zahuga number two. So Hooligan number one missed, I think, or maybe I skipped his turn. Yeah, I skipped his turn. So Hooligan number one. Oh, he did the, uh, the spear jab and missed. Um, he gets a bite attack too. And he hit too. So now he gets a couple points of damage. So now he has the Blood Frenzy as well. So both of them have advantage constantly. So Moo Shakalaka is now going to disengage and get the heck out of here. So he's going to move up here. He's going to move through here. And then he's going to move here. That's as far as he can move. So that's his turn. So he disengaged. I'm going to hit the down arrow. So Hooga number one is going to chase. So he is moving here. He loses five feet as he's cut through his ally. He can only move 25 max. That's that. That's his turn. And he is the one that has his spear. So he's going to huck it. He's going to throw it. Just with reckless abandon. Oh, and he gets advantage. So he's going to launch a spear at the running or the moving Mooshakalaka. Oh, pulled a 20. 
My goodness. So now the damage part. Let's see what happens. Double damage. Now he's in the heavy damage territory. So he's kind of hurt. Mushakalaka is not doing well. Doing well. He's over half his hit points down. So number two, he moves. And he moves here. And he moves here. And he loses five feet to go past his ally. So he can actually only move to there. So that's his turn. So now, Mooshakalak is going to move here and down here. And he's going to go upstairs. So I'm going to move him into the portal. It says, do you wish to go to the mid deck? Yes. So now the mid deck map comes up. He still has at least five or 10 feet of movement. So he's going to move out. So that's his turn. And he's going to shout for help. So that's his turn. So the Sahuigans stay below. They don't come up. So now it's back to his turn. He's screaming and yelling for help. Since he's wounded and he doesn't have any pursuit, he's going to go to his inventory. And I want to see if he has any potions. Does he have any healing potions? Yeah, he has one potion of healing. So that does 2d4 plus 2 on healing. Let me see if I can drag that over here. Yeah, so I'm going to make the healing potion. So I'm going to go ahead and click the edit button. I'm going to click the star. I'm just going to call this magic items. So now I'm going to label it. So this is a healing potion. So now I'm going to right click on the healing potion, click on add action. This time it's going to be a healing function. And now that I have the healing function, I'm going to define it. So this says 2d4 plus two. So I'm going to right click on the four sided dice, click two. Drag it over, put two here in the bonus area, and that's a done deal. And it's still on targets, so don't mess with that. And what you'll notice is you don't really have a description here. So if you wanted to, you can copy this description. And paste it in there so you have something. Because this is just an item description. This will also be like an effect description. So now when you do this and you want to bring this potion up, you would click on it and it should give you the, the description of it. Yep, right there. So you had a potion up here called consumables. I wanted to show you how I made it. Now I go to preparation mode. I change this to one and once. So that keeps care of how many you use. Then I go back to combat and actions. And I should have right here is the potion. So he's going to drink the potion on his turn. So all I have to do is drag the potion either to his combat tracker entry or to his token. In this case, I'll do the combat tracker entry. It healed four points of damage, which sucks, but it brought him back into feeling a little bit better. And now that it's used, I have to click here and that gets rid of it off the, the sheet. So at the end of the game, I would come here and delete it off my inventory. So that's how you would do that. Yeah, those portals are really new. 
um, I would really first want to get you to learn how to use the interface before you start using the portals. But they are cool. And that's where they're at. Yeah, the portal thing is kind of handy. You don't have to have it. Like I was showing earlier, you can link the maps together and bring up the maps as you need them. However, if you want to learn how to use Fantasy Grounds, you know, make sure that you learn the interface and what it does before you start getting into all that. So there's a couple other cool things I want to show you. So, in Fantasy Grounds, when you're building a character, it's very time consuming. So, when you build a character, there are some products out there to make to make your life easier. So these again are not with the regular rule sets. One of the products that I recommend that makes things easier are the 5e effects coding um, equipment, background equipment. So if you go to modules, I'm going to actually load this. If you purchase this module, it'll go in your modules folder. So here it is, it's this background and class equipment bundle. So what this does is when you're creating a character, I'm gonna bring a, uh, a, a blank one up. So I'm gonna go to PC. Let's say we're gonna make a cleric. So I'm gonna go ahead and add item, which is adding the character sheet. Now I'm gonna be skipping ahead just to kind of show you how this works. So back here in his inventory, you have your equipment. The old way to do this was to go to items and then you would drag over each individual item. So I'm going to put a healing potion on him. So here's a healing potion. Drag this over and it adds it to the equipment. Now well, that takes a long time to go through the class list for all your items that you get. So what Rob and I had done, this is, I came up with the idea, but Rob actually made the module. So I'm gonna go to parcels and we've created all the background equipment and all the class starting equipment. So now instead of just being one item at a time or a backpack, what we've done is created a module that is allowed so that you can drag over whatever you are. So in this case, if this dwarf was an acolyte, I would drag over the acolyte bundle and that puts all the items in here at once. So if you open up the shortcut, this is all the items that are inside this parcel. The parcels are basically treasure. So instead of treating these like treasure, these are like bundles that you can start with. So it makes life much quicker and easier for you. Under the same token, if you scroll further down, you also have the starting equipment for a cleric. So I drop that on there. There's all the gear for the cleric. This is the A list that comes from the starting equipment. So if you pick a cleric, um, there'll be a starting list for equipment. And then your background also gives you equipment. So when you're building a character, the old way is you used to have to go through and search for every single item. So now that makes this a little bit quicker. There are backpacks that have a, some items in there, but this gives you everything. This gives you the weapons, the shield, the armor, all the kits, everything that goes with that class. Except for the alternate B-list equipment, of course, in which you can swap things out as you need them. But it's much easier to start from here than going one thing at a time. So that's handy. That really helps. Um, yeah, that would have been very useful, exactly. It's a real pain to do that. So another cool thing is clerics get all the spells, basically, right? So they get to start off with some cantrips, and let's say you're a third level, and you get access to all the spells. Doesn't mean you can cast them all, it just means you have access to them. So rather than dragging every single spell over or a dozen of them 
at a time, or, or a dozen of them. You can go to the spells now. This is another extension, and it's pretty cheap. It's like a couple bucks. So I'm going to go to the library. I'm going to pretend I'm picking my spells for this character. So I probably should build just the basics. So I'm going to give him a background of Acolyte. So I'm in the create PC mode here. So I'm going to pick his background. So that's Acolyte. I'm going to leave all his stats at 10. I'm not worried about it right now. Uh, race. I'm going to make him a dwarf. So I'm going to go ahead and grab his race. I'm going to make him a hill dwarf. So dwarf. Drag that over. Select hill dwarf. Done deal. I'm going to pick his class. So I'm going to go over here, grab classes, and pick cleric. It wants me to pick two skills. So before I do that, I'm going to click here. So I already have insight and religion. So I'm going to pick history and medicine. Click the check mark. And then it wants to know what domain. I'm going to pick life domain and click that to confirm. So now I have this character that's partially built. And the reason I'm doing this for spells. So I'm going to go ahead and level them up to level three. So all you have to do is pick this up, drag it in there. It adds the levels provided you have the books open and then do this again. And now he's level three. It's that easy to level up. So now he has access to probably first and second level spells. I'm going to put his ammo here. He has a mace. He's ready to go. He has 900 experience. 2700 for next level. Okay, so now I'm going to start picking his spells. So he gets three or four cantrips. And you get that information from your class. So if you open this up, Open up your class. Go ahead and bookmark it so you don't have to come back to it. That way, if you close this, you accidentally forget, just pop it up for shortcuts. And if you scroll down about halfway, you'll get the tables where it has all the good information. Like, okay, so he gets three cantrips and he gets access to uh, first and second level spells. So I'll go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go to the spells area. I'm going to go to the 5 EFX coding spells. This is another module. You can also do this with the player's handbook spells. They're pretty close. I'm going to change level to zero. Because those are cantrips. And the source is cleric. So I'm just going to drag over three cantrips. So... I'm going to drag over Guidance. I'm going to dra drag over, uh, let's see, Light. And I'm going to drag over probably Toll of the Dead or Word, I don't know. Well, Sacred Flight. Okay, those are his cantrip. Another thing I'm going to do is sometimes the spells don't parse. So in other words, for light, there's a saving throw with a DC 8. That's not quite right. So if you open this up temporarily, and then you close it, it will actually change it to 10 because of your bonus, your proficiency bonus. For some reason, the spells, they don't always parse. So now it's based on wisdom. Every now and then you have to do that to get it to auto-calculate. What you're doing is you're forcing Fantasy Grounds to re-examine all your spells. So all I do is either I'll go in here and change this to your ability score, or I'll go into the spells themselves, the ones that have saving throws, and open that up temporarily, and then close it. It'll re recalculate. You don't have to do that with every spell. Once it does it once, it should be fixed. So now I'm going to go to... First level spells. 
So here's all the first level spells. So the old way of doing this would be just to drag them over one at a time. So now they have this extension that says drag list. So this is good for like clerics and droids. Wizards and warlocks and such, probably not so much. But anyone that gets access to all the spells. So clerics get access to all the spells and then some. So if I click drag list, it puts all the spells on here in one shot. Okay, so that way you don't have to dick around with doing it one at a time. This actually makes it convenient for you. So that you can have an easier time building characters, it's a lot quicker. Right now I'm just compressing these so they don't take up so much room. And I'm in standard mode right now. So you can only prepare up to so many spells per day. So that's usually your level plus your proficiency bonus, something like that, or your spell casting bonus. There's a formula. So he's only going to prepare a couple of these or a few of them per day, maximum. And that doesn't count as bonus spells he gets from his domain. Some of these would be bonus spells. So if that's the case, you just come here in preparation mode. Yeah, I know he gets bless as a bonus spell, cure wounds as a bonus spell. And now he can probably get three or four more spells. So I'm going to do Guiding Bolts. Uh, protection from evil or good. And maybe Command. So those are his spells that he's got prepared. So now when you come in combat mode, it's only going to show you the prepared spells. Not the entire list. So the same thing go for second level spells. Now that he has access to them. I'm going to go drag list. And I'm dragging it right where it says spell slots. Same thing. It's going to dump every single one in that list here in this pane. And I'm, all I'm doing now is compressing them so they don't take as much room. Because they're all expanded right now. Okay. And I'll go to preparation mode. And prepare a few of these. So hold person... Uh, spiritual weapon, and maybe prayer healing. So those are the three that I have prepared for the day. So you can see this spell casting DC isn't quite right. So I'm going to go to this window, and automatically it's now it's switched to DC 10. I don't know why it does that, but Fantasy Grounds has to parse through all the spells. But once it does it, it should be fixed. So anything with a saving throw, like right here, here's a DC 8, that's not right open that up now it changed to a dc 10 so i'm not sure why it does that but it does and it's based on wisdom so it they kind of straighten themselves out so anything else with the saving throw in that group or category should have a better dc based off my level and my proficiency bonus so not really seeing too many more that would require saving throws oh here's one so it didn't parse if I come in here and I change this, I didn't even change anything. I just open it. Now it parses it. That's the only thing I really worry about with spell casting. For some reason, it doesn't always parse. So that's that. So now I have all the spells. If I go to combat mode and actions, now all the spells that I have memorized for the day are just showing. Or prepared for the day, I should say. Memorize would be more of like a wizard. Can you add this? I didn't see the faceless... What? I just made a character... Can you add the, to this? I don't see faceless... What? Can you add to this? Um, I think so. You would have to create your own list and then use that list as what you'd bring over. So you can make your own spell book, in a sense, in the spells category, and then drag all those over. I don't think you can mix and match. I think you'd have to make your own groups. So in other words, if there was spells that you wanted to group together, like spells that you use all the time for your characters, you could make a new group up here, drag all the spells that you like into that, and have it display as a list, and then drag all those over at once. So you could do that. You can call it 
so and so's spell book and then drag all the spells that you want copies of them into that group and then you can use the drag list so that's how you would do that add to the module background was an earlier question oh yes you totally could you could make your own kits kind of the same thing you'd go to items and then you would just create all the items you wanted or put them together in group make your own group up here in the items and consider that as like your your inventory and then you would drag those into a parcel so a parcel is a treasure chest and you can make up your own parcels which would essentially be your kits or your packages so you don't have to just go by the ones that go with your background and your class you can make up your own so if you always want the same equipment every time you play like a rogue you can make up your own parcel and once you do that you can drag that over to your characters so you don't have to go through all this every time you make a character so yes you can totally do your own so paladin would be the same as cleric right they know all the spells but need to prepare so that would be useful for yes Paladins, clerics, and rangers it'd be useful for. I'm sure there's other usages, but those are the ones I think of right off the off the bat. Anything that has access to all the spells, that's where that comes in hand. Um, wizards have to build their spell book. So what I would do is make your spell book and create a group. So I would call it so-and-so spell book. Uh, rangers, maybe. Yeah, that might work for them. Because there's a ranger spell list. But wizards, warlocks, and sorcerers, I don't think that would work. So there's another thing I wanted to show you, speaking of, is... Another extension is the one shape, uh, the, the one click druid wild shapes. It's a module and an extension. It's a module. So you have to load the module. And you also have to have the extension loaded. So what I'm going to do is take that character that we just built. Just pretend it's a druid, even though it's not. It's close enough. It's a, it's a cleric. So we're just going to say Druid. So Druids get Wild Shape. So what I'm going to do is make a new section on the sheet. So a new group. So I'm going to click the star. Wild Shapes. I'm going to also call this wild shape and I don't want it all the way at the bottom so I'm going to put an asterisk Because it's going to alphabetize. So if I do that, it's going to put this on top. That's what I want. Because it alphabetizes the category names. So I'm hiding the spell list right now. So it's not too crazy. So we'll just pretend this is a druid, even though it's a cleric. What we're going to do is his wild shapes, he gets three of them for third level. So I'm going to right click on here. Nope, I don't need to do that. I'm just going to go to the edit, change it to preparation. This is going to be daily. So he gets three uses daily, which means after he rests, those will replenish. So now there's three bubbles that indicate when he uses the wild shape. Now with the module, you have the actual wild shapes. So instead of taking an NPC stat block, like a wolf and using that what you're going to do is you're going to create an effect 
or you'll have an effect that will emulate the wolf. So when you do a druid wild shape, the old way to do it would be to go to NPCs, bring out the wolf, So I'm just going to do it with a regular wolf. You'd put it on the combat tracker. Then you would change it to a friendly. And then you would drag this NPC stat block to your player so that they can control it. And then when it came to the wolf's turn, your player would have the character sheet bookmarked. And when he needed to use it, he'd pull up the stat block. And then he could see what's going on. And then he could drag the attacks and stuff over to the uh, enemies. But with the wild shape, now you don't have to do that anymore. So with that, first of all, the DM goes into the story mode. And what you want to do is go to the one-click druid. So here's the one-click druid. This is the guide. And in here, if you have a moon druid or not. So the moon druid has higher access to different animal shapes. So I'm gonna pick new moon druid because that's the circle of the moon. This sheet here is a guide that tells you what you get per level. So when you wild shape or level two or below or level three and below, this is what you get. You get access to all these level, these creatures. No flying or no swimming. There's already a convenient list of wild shapes. These are all the ones you can pick from at third level for the moon druid. So you just can't have flying or swimming creatures. So I'm going to look for the wolf, which is kind of the example I was using earlier. So this is the wolf. It's set up like a spell. It has some functions in here. It has a direct link to the wolf. It even has some of their attacks on here. So basically this is a, a, a spell, but it's been converted so they can be used as an effect. So it's basically like a spell effect. The other nice thing is this list, you can right click on it and share it with your player. So you would drag this over and drop it on one of your player's um, portrait, whoever the druid is. Then he or she in turn could take this Drag it to the hotkeys, so they always have a list handy. Then before the game session, I would ask them to pick three wild shapes that they want to use. So in this case, be the wolf. That's one wild shape. Uh, he also likes the warhorse. And just in case, the brown bear. Or a dire wolf, whatever brown bear okay so those are the three he gets to start with for the game i'm kind of limiting maybe no more than five because they have to have seen the animal in the wild and observed it so by third level it should leave you no know, three wild shapes um it's kind of subjective it's up to, between you and your players but i usually give them three to start with and as the adventure goes on they can add a couple more i just don't want it to be you know random that, that can be a little too crazy but with this now this makes it simpler so i don't have to worry about it as much that way i'm not having to dig out a bunch of different npc stat blocks so those are the wild shapes so next i need to put the druid on the battle map before i do that i'm going to put a token for him so i'm going to use this wood elf druid And then I'm going to go to token and I'm going to look for that druid S in distress. And I'll just leave it like that. So now I'm going to drag this onto the combat track. All right. So now I'm going to put her on that ship with the rest. So there's where the Sahuigans are. She's not going to go there. But she might be on the top deck. And she hears a trouble below. 
So I'm going to put her on the battle map. And I'm going to move her over to the doorway. Yes, yeah, she's going to jump over the barrel. So I'd have her make an athletics check. Um, anyway, she's there and she hears the commotion. So she's getting ready to. But then she decides to do her wild shape. So rather than giving her control of the stat block, which is ridiculous, it's difficult to do. She's going to transform into her actual druid wild shape. So here is the wild shape she has to pick from. I'm going to change this to actions. So there's all the buttons. These are for attack rolls, damage, and any effects. So in this case, she's going to change into the wild shape of the wolf. So she's going to check off one of her usages, which is just a manual thing. And I want you to pay attention. There's her token. And then on her stat block, she has all 10s except for a couple changes in here. There's an 11 wisdom and a 12 con. She has 24 hit points, 16 AC. Her movement rate is 25, all that stuff. So now when I use the effect, which is on the abilities tab, or excuse me, on the actions tab, all I have to do is click on this button. It changes her token on the combat tracker and on the battle map and it changed her stuff. So she has a 13 dex or 13 AC and then she has all these stat changes according to the animal wild shape and she has the animals hit points. And then all the effects are actually on here. It tells you what's there. So all these different things are what offsets what she already has on her character sheet. So it really doesn't do much other than transform the character into the wild shape. You don't have to use a stat block anymore. And she can operate as the wolf. So I'm going to make her move to the, to the deck below. You want to go down to mid deck? Yes. That's, huh, what happened to her? Huh, oh, she's here. Okay, she's out here. She moves this way, runs around, and heads down to attack the Sahu again. Yeah, she wants to go to the bilge. So she comes down here. Moves that way. And she goes to attack the Sahu again. That would take a few rounds, of course. I'm just trying to speed things up. So now, I will close these in the background. The Druidess will now use her actions to operate like the wolf. So she already transformed. This is her tack roll for her bite. This is the attack roll for, I believe, her... This is melee. The other one is a saving throw. So basically, one of her abilities allows her to uh, pounce or knock someone down. So her first attack on the Sahuigan, she's going to try to basically to attack him. So first I'm going to read to see what that says. So it says bite. So the target has to make a DC 11 strength save or be knocked prone. So it's going to bite him and try to pull him down. So her first attack will be like here. Well, she actually missed. We'll just say she succeeded. And now she's going to do the cast, which will decide if he's prone or not. In this case, he succeeded, so he's not prone. But she gets to roll for damage because she was able to bite him. And she did heavy damage to him. That's her turn. Moonshakalaka is still upstairs. So Hooligan number one is here. He can't reach her. 
So who again number two? Okay, he's going to make an attack roll on the druid. So instead of having to attack the NPC stat block, he actually gets to attack the druid. So he's going to make his attack. He gets two. So he's going to do a claw attack first. And he hit. And now he does some damage to her. So if we look on here, she has 11 points. So it probably won't do a lot of damage, but... So did three points of damage there. Now he gets a claw attack or bite attack again. Another hit. So there she took some more damage. So she's already taken six of 11. So I'm gonna damage her one more time. And what you'll notice is that she'll go back to her normal form. So on the combat tracker, her druid thing is still the wolf. So if I do more damage to her. Okay, she's got one point left, so it hasn't destroyed her wild shape yet. So I'm going to go ahead and do one more damage. Yeah, it actually did work. So her druid thing will turn back. And the bleed over damage from Yep, I lost the uh, OBS. It crashed on me. So not much I can do about that. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but uh, OBS definitely took a shit on us. So basically, what I was trying to say about the druid, the one-click druid, is that you can transform into the shape of the wild shape that you're trying to do and it will go back automatically so if you were trying to you know make your own wild shape and go back that's the way you would do it so let me see if i can get this to come back up there we go so not sure what happened but silly obs crashed on me All right, these actions bridge to the new version, or do we know yet? Yeah, so most of the most of the new um, plugins we covered what they can do on previous shows, and the authors and the publisher did say that they were going to carry over into Unity. Matter of fact, they've already got some of the versions made. They're just waiting for it to go public. So yes, absolutely, we'll be able to use them once they've figured out what Unity is going to do. They're going to do that. Uh, Unity is the newest version of Fantasy Grounds. It's going to be coming out within the next couple months or so. And what it does is it gives you more memory to work with. It makes it a little bit easier to connect. And you'll have some in-map tools. Right now, it's in a private beta, so I can't show it. But I am testing it, and there's a bunch of alpha testers, including myself, that are just testing it out. It's going to be a 64-bit program. You're going to have more memory uh, usage available to you, and you'll have some in-game map tools. So you can build your own maps within the interface instead of importing a static map. And it'll also have line of sight, that sort of thing. If you want to know more about it, 
if you join our community, uh, fantasygroundscollege.net, if you go to our Discord, or if you read our articles, there are several examples, news, updates in our community. Uh, we have a channel for Unity, and we have an article on our website. So if you want to know more about what's happening there, you can just go to those those outlets. You can also ask around in the official Fantasy Grounds forums. There's been announcements and such since the uh, since it started out. So, some tips about Fantasy Grounds: you do not want to um, basically you don't want to load too many modules. And you don't want to have too many extensions. That might have been why it crashed on. And the other thing is you don't want to have too many tokens. So you want to unshare images or unshare maps or unshare modules that you don't use in a current campaign. That keeps the memory load down. Right now you only have about three and a half gigs. Once that fills up with memory and resources, it'll start getting unstable and crash on. So be really ca careful about how you proceed. Um, more is less, at least at this point. Once the new Fantasy Grounds comes out, you'll be able to have, you know, higher resolution images and more things open at once. Uh, the other thing is um, you want to make sure that you spend the time to learn Fantasy Grounds. There's a lot to it. It takes a lot of patience and a lot of time into it to really get the full uh, effect of it. Um, some people use it just for like tabletop. They don't really utilize the whole thing. They'll utilize the map and maybe track some tokens or such on it, which is fine. There's no problem. But then you can also take advantage of all the automation, all the fancy stuff, like I showed you earlier today. All those three things are pretty much cutting edge, top of the line stuff. Not expecting you to, to learn how to use that right away. But you have an idea of what can be done with Fantasy Grounds. Um, the, the base core rules are pretty much all you need. But if you want to make life easier on you, then you want to go out and purchase some of the main books like the player's handbook the monster manual the dungeon master's guide or if you're using another rule set buy at least the core rule books that way it's easier on you and then just start building your own content you don't necessarily have to have the adventures and the settings you can actually do a lot of that on your own but if you have the core books you can pretty much can fly um, if you only have the player's handbook and you only intend on playing that's pretty much all you'll need um, but if you really want to start building characters on Moss, you want to basically buy the character building books, which would be like, you know, Morton Kanan's, uh, Tom, you know, his, his books, or you want to get Bolo's Guide, which gives you some of the monstrous races like goblins and such. Or if you want to add more stuff to it, you can always get Xanathar's Guide. So the, those are character creation books um, elemental evil sword coast adventure guide and i think there's one other that gives you some more backgrounds and a couple more archetypes but the three main ones is the player's handbook uh the xanathar's guide to everything and the um what is that the uh morgan canaan's tome of foes so those books are the main ones there's a ton of third-party stuff out there. As a matter of fact, there's a module on the DMs Guild that just came out. It allows you to play almost every single race in the player's handbook. Someone went through all the trouble to convert them into character form so that you can play vampires and all kinds of stuff. Who did that? Want to become famous by followers on follow not... No thing. That sounds like a band. <laughs> Phase 1973. Please move on. Don't need that kind of spam.
<laughs> As I get older, I want less followers. Yeah. I don't mind followers, but not robots. So we don't need that. Yep, so that is basically how you can use those three new products. I showed you guys how to set up the table, how to get everything kind of functioning. Um, we teach DM classes. We teach content creation. We teach uh, how to build characters properly, because there is a specific order. And also we're going to start um, you know, we have one shots where you can get practice in. And there's a lot of good community members in our Discord. Um, we're mainly focused around education, but we do have the occasional game or like a community event. Like in the summertime, we have our um, community birthday, basically. It's Founders Day, and that's at the end of July. <laughs> Yeah, I'll do that. So, let me mod Bofferin. Quick question, is there a quick way to undo an action when creating a character? Nope. There isn't. And that is something that Smitework is going to address. So, that is one bad thing about the character builder in 5th edition. Is it doesn't really have a guide or a way to undo something. So if you accidentally drag over the wrong thing, pretty much better off to start over. So they are developing a character creator that will allow for that. So that is coming down the pipe. It is a heavily required requested thing. It'll make my job much easier. Then I can focus on more of the details instead of trying to focus in on, you must make the character a certain way. Because right now you do. You have to do your ability scores first. You have to do your background, your race, and then your class. If you don't build it in that order, it's not going to turn out right. So try to remember that. Practice. Get some, you know, get some help if you need to. And also get your players to practice it too. The more you teach your players, the easier your job is if you're going to be running campaigns and such. So that'll really help you. So is there any other questions? And yes, Boffer and I will mod you. Let me see. And like you, Lairon, recommended last night, export your character before you level up in case. Yeah, that's a big... It's a walk-through glass kind of learning. Definitely makes you learn to do it correctly. Yeah, you do walk-through poles and sharp glass. For sure. It's kind of how the college was uh, was formulated because of that. So let me see. How do I mod you? So I'm going to go to stream and chat. And I go to Bofren. And we are friends. And you are a mod now and we can ban phase 1973 thank you thank you so yes export the character before you level up is very important that way if you make a mistake at seventh level you're not having to recreate yeah, thanks, Boffrin. You're not having to recreate your character. That is a big, big, big problem. So export it. And if you don't know how to export it, here's what you do. So in Fantasy Ground, in the character selection window, go to PC. And let's say these are one of the characters. So you would click the edit button and you get this blue down arrow. You click that, it'll ask you what file name you want it to be make sure you name it level one or level two as you go on and maybe use your character name and maybe the class so you know what the hell it is that's how you export 
You want to do that at every level for your players. So, when a player attacks with a longsword, which is versatile, is there a way to equip it with both hands so the player can roll a d10? Well, there's two ways to handle it. There's a plug-in that's called handedness or something. It's a, it's a plug-in that allows you to do it on the fly. Or you have to make two separate entries for the same weapon. So, for instance, I'm going to go to my druid. And the druidess has a mace, which is not a versatile weapon. So I'm going to grab an item. Quarterstaff. So a quarterstaff is versatile. If you open up the properties of it, there's the versatile property. So what you have to do is essentially create another version of it. So I'm going to click on add weapon. So I want to edit, click this thing. Here's my new weapon. So right now there's nothing on it. So I'm just going to copy and paste the values. So this is the one that says two handed. Then instead of having a D six, this is wants a D eight. So I'm going to drag a D eight. And then the type of damage, I can just drag that over. And there you go. There's your, so all this stuff should match except for the damage type or the damage dice. Everything else is the same. So now when you use that weapon, you have a one handed variation and a two handed variation. So that's how you would do that. How do you export? Um, I showed that. So again, if you have a character that's already made, you can go to the PC area. If you already have characters in here, you click on the bottom right corner, edit list, and it creates these little blue arrows. Click on the blue arrow and it'll export it as an XML file. At which case you can import it later or you can send it to a DM, or you can even print it online. But in this case, this is just to show you where to look. If you want to export, you click the blue arrow. You click the blue arrow again, or this is importing. And then you would import whatever characters you have. So I'm going to bring over Haglin Rockfist. He's a battle rager. So I hit import. I go back, and here's old Haglin the Battle Rager. I'm going to give him a, a picture. So he's going to have a Dwarven mugshot. Let's see. So there's old Haglin. He's a barbarian. Find him a token. So I'm going to go to tokens. So technically, your token, your portrait, becomes your token if you don't already have one. But if you have a token, you can replace it. So here's a little Battle Rager token. It says Dwarf here. And as you can see, he kind of has that Battle Rager armor. So I can replace that. Now he has a cool 3D top-down looking token instead of a, a picture. The only problem is that they're harder to see on battle map. So then if I bring him over to the combat tracker. There you go. And I'm going to go to the menu. I'm going to click rest. And I'm going to give him a long rest. So everyone's rested. I'm going to remove the Sahuigan from the map. Or from the uh, combat tracker. So that's how you import and export characters. So yeah, if you uh, build characters, that is something that you want to learn is how to import and export. Normally, I'll just go up and build them randomly between second and fifth level. So I always have you know, some kind of characters to pull from. 
there are other resources. I think the Fantasy Grounds official Discord, or excuse me, the official website has free gens. I know Rob sells some with his packages. Uh, there are some free ones out there. I even think at one time there was free ones on the DMs go as well. They're pre-generated characters. They're not all coded up fancy, but they do have a lot of variation. I know Rob worked on a, a module that has like 80 or 100 of them in there. He and I went through there and looked at that, and he built them all. I helped him in the very beginning, but he, he actually built them all, made a spreadsheet, and built every combination. So that was crazy. It was every basic combination. No, no multi-classing, anything like that. We just built all the archetypes and all the different uh, classes is what, what was done. Races varied, but everything. He built all the archetypes and all the classes. So you figure there's, you know, so many classes. Each class has anywhere from two to three archetypes, plus some variations on that. So he, he made some a whole bunch. So another cool thing about maps is I'm going to actually bring up a map here. So let's go to this cool pirate map thing. You have this little arrow up here. If you click on that, you can actually get it to be a larger photo. And it's kind of like part of the, the background. You can even go to full screen where basically the map takes over the whole thing. So you can actually conduct some stuff with that, but it kind of bulking gets in the way. So you can do that if need be. That might be good for effect. Like if you wanted to show, you know, something that's going on, that might be a cool thing. Another thing is uh, on your combat sh party, party sheet, if you use this as a DM, this is where you put all your players. For a one shot, I don't think I would use it. But if these three characters were part of your group, you can drag them on here. And that's how you, how you keep track of your group as overall. This is where you would distribute loot. You can set up their marching order. And then you would award quest items and encounter items through here, which is experience points. So the party sheet's kind of a cool thing too, if you're DMing. So usually the DM has access to that. Are ISO maps? Not yet. Mostly top down. I think in Unity, it will become more of a thing as time goes on. But I know in the future, they plan maybe a few years down the line to do isometric maps. And Unity will have a much more uh, chance to support that than Fantasy Grounds Classic. So for right now, for the next couple of years, most of your maps are going to be top down. So any other questions before I get ready to leave? Or do you want to see something else? Um, I'm in no big hurry, really. I just wanted to make sure that you guys get an idea of some of the latest and greatest and get some ideas and tips on Fantasy Grounds. So when you first start out, you definitely want to practice. The portal thing and all the other things I showed you are on the DM skill. So... If you go to the D Dungeon Masters Guild and you look for Portals Extension, it'll take you right there. Um, also, the other thing was one-click Druid Essentials. So if you want the module that allows your Druid to transform into a Wild Shape, that's also on the DMs Guild. And the Spell Extension, which allows you to drag over the entire spell list that's also there and then the coding effects for like the spells class features beats all that those that's the spell coding effects or that's the uh, effects coding bundle so that's also available that does all the automation for the different classes races 
and archetypes. So I wasn't trying to make this a commercial for for Rob and Bob, but it's inevitable because it's a really cool um, extensions. Yep, same area. Background equipment and items bundle is in the DM Scout Guild. Just look for Rob 2E and Diablo Bob. They're the ones that create this stuff. I made five or six characters last night in the same time it took me to make one the night before. Yeah, once you understand where everything is, it goes a lot quicker. I still have a hard time with warlocks. They're, they're a real pain because you got to read a lot of their um, pack boons and how it affects their spells and such. Yeah, no problem. I hope I can do these every once in a while to help you guys out. I do upload these to YouTube. Um, I don't know if I'm going to upload this one because it's very specific. And I'm making a lock. It will be ready in July. What? I'm making a lock. Oh, Warlock. Got it. <laughs> yeah, Warlocks are tough. Um, we do have videos to show you how to build those. But it only builds one of the three pack boons. So if you have a custom one or you know one of the pack boons that we didn't cover, then that might be an issue for you. But generally it just changes the spell's potency or you get more spells. You pick Pack of the Tome, you wouldn't know you're a Warlock. You get like a whole bunch of spells and things that you have access to. Even though you can only cast two, you're a fourth level Warlock casting all your spells at fourth level that kicks butt. So I don't know if the music was too loud. Did you guys hear any music in the background? I try not to make that too ridiculous. A lot of these I made myself, so I don't have to worry about copyright. But I didn't want it to be too loud where you can't hear what I'm saying. That's good. I'm trying to make it so if I have any uh, uh, or pauses, you have something. I catch myself bobbing my head. <laughs> yeah. I have it on super low, so I can barely hear it on my headset. So Boffrin is now a moderator on the Fantasy Grounds Discord. Or the Fantasy Grounds College Twitch channel. Uh, let's see. So we're down to eight watchers. So I think I've pretty much covered what I want to cover today. If there's something specific, like if you're having trouble, we have a knowledge base on our website. So Fantasy Grounds. Yeah, the birds are making you fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> the Fantasy Grounds uh, College.net. If you look on the website, we have a knowledge base. So a lot of this information that you might be looking for or clueless about, we have articles on there. Like if you want to make your own modules, we have articles about that. Um, yep. Need to smack down on that damn bot. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, we need to have you guys know where this resources are. Uh, you have YouTube that has a ton of videos. We even build specific classes and there's some DM classes on there that are pre-taped. The only problem with that is it's harder to ask the question. So yes, ask the experts is basically where that would be. Yeah, Boffrin, I don't have any of the chat commands enabled yet. I got to get that up and running. Yep, I need the command. Yep. I haven't set that part up yet. So if there's no other questions, I'm going to call it a day. Take a little break. I've been consuming info so I can attend a class with some knowledge. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it helps. You got to be able to uh, know what questions to ask. Because when we dump two hours information dump on you, you're probably going to miss half the stuff. So two hour info dump isn't always the answer. Yep, 
No problem. You guys take care and hopefully I'll see you in the community. Offering thanks. And I'll talk to the rest of you later. All right, cool. Later, guys.